Have you ever thought about upgrading to a Ridge wallet? Well, now's the perfect time. You probably all know the sponsor of today's video, Ridge, the wallet that's changing the game. Their new Hyper Lime collection is inspired by the fluorescent shades found in high performance gear, a hue that speaks volumes yet serves a purpose. From winter slopes and late night runs to Palm Springs tennis courts, this dynamic yellow plays an essential role in peak performance. These wallets hold 1 to 12 cards without stretching out, blocks RFID to prevent wireless theft, it's scratch resistant, has a lifetime warranty and a 99 day risk free trial with replaceable screws and elastics. And you can head over to their website and use my code Let's Read for 10% off at checkout as well. And key case enthusiasts can rejoice as well, because you can securely carry 1 to 6 keys that won't jangle around in your pocket. With over 80,000 5 star reviews, Ridge is trusted and adored. I swear by them, myself and all my friends have one and they're so sure that you'll love it too. Elevate your style with Ridge, where fashion meets function. And when you use my link in the description or pinned comment below, you can use code Let's Read at checkout for 10% off. My most terrifying workplace experience involved an encounter with what I believed to be a demonic entity. It was an experience that I'll never forget. This happened a few years ago when I was working overnights as a custodian on a college campus. Working nights in an empty building is creepy by default, but there was something different going on in building 8. Something unsettling something malignant. Starting the very first day after being reassigned to that building, I began having intense nightmares. And these weren't your normal bad dreams. They were unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Night after night of violence and carnage, and they didn't go away when I woke up. They lingered long into my shift each night. A key piece of backstory was my recent divorce. I was only a few months removed from it when I started working there and that divorce destroyed me, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. I went through a prolonged dark stretch and this job was the first step to getting me back on my feet. I liked having a series of tasks to keep me busy each shift, it gave me a sense of purpose and accomplishment. But that all changed when they moved me to Building 8. There was something different about those shifts. A pervasive creepiness that grew as each shift wore on. It was unsettling. I had a co-worker that we called the Gentle Giant whose shift ended halfway through mine. I hated to see him go because once he was gone, I was alone in the building for the rest of the night. At that point, my uneasiness would rapidly intensify, almost like the malignant force knew that I was now alone and would ramp up the psychological oppression. Fragments of the previous night's nightmares would force their way to the surface, and they were horrifying. In each dream, a new murderous, lust-filled chapter unfolded. The dreams would start with me attacking my ex in some violent, rage-filled manner, and then I'd have my way with her in every way possible. Sometimes mutually, sometimes against her will, but always afterward I'd finish her off in some brutal fashion, usually with a blade, but sometimes with my own bare hands. Having a nightmare like that just once is eye-opening enough, but having it night after night is horrific and it affected me, poisoned me with intrusive thoughts, left me teetering on the verge of real-life violent outbursts. And it goes without saying, but I probably should mention it, that is not who I normally am. I've never been violent toward any women, let alone my ex, and the last time I got into a fight was in middle school. Needless to say, those nightmares were changing me into someone else, and I feared that I was nearing a breaking point. Between the divorce, the sleep deprivation, and whatever was in that building slowly overtaking me, my sanity was teetering on the brink, and something was bound to give. There was another unwanted side effect of those nightmares, and that was me obsessing over my ex all over again. 
I'd find myself scouring her social media, dwelling on all the ways she'd done me wrong, fixating on her posts with her new boyfriend and becoming increasingly vengeful. My obsession got so bad that one morning, after my shift, I found myself parked outside her apartment, contemplating how easy it would be to make one of those nightmares a reality. I shook off that compulsion and drove away, but it was undeniable that some oppressive force was slowly enveloping my mind, body, and soul. And then came the night of my creepy experience. I was on the back half of my shift on an otherwise typical night. Jared had already left, and once he did, the images from my nightmares began to overwhelm my thoughts. I put on a podcast to distract my mind, and it did help, but the oppressive force intensified. And then I thought I heard something. The sounds of someone shuffling down the hall. I thought maybe Jared had returned and I went looking for him. As I did, the shuffling sound continued but I couldn't pinpoint what direction it was coming from. I found doors unlocked, lights left on, but no sign of Jared or anyone else. After looking around, I tried to convince myself that it was just the sounds of the building settling. And then it happened. I heard a cacophony of banging sounds throughout the entire building. I turned around to see the classroom doors of the hallway were all thrown open, close to a dozen of them. These were heavy fire doors and had to be manually opened. My pulse was racing as I stood there alone in the empty hallway. Images from my nightmares flashed through my mind. I turned and ran, and as I did, I heard whispers from every direction whispers telling me to end her, to punish her. And when I rushed out of Building 8 and ran across the empty parking lot, the whispers seemed to follow, and it felt like they were chasing me. It took me a frustratingly long couple of seconds to retrieve my car keys, but when I finally found them and piled into my car, the whispers slowly receded. I drove out of the parking lot and went straight home, and I never went back to that job. The phone calls from the college began a few hours later and continued steadily for the next few days. I never answered a single one. Eventually, they slowed and then ceased altogether. And just like that, my nightmare stopped. The irritability faded and I began to feel like my normal self. I found a new job doing admin work and I got back to living. And then, maybe it was six months later, I ran into my old co-worker Jared in the parking lot of a strip mall. He was excited to see me and he immediately asked me what happened that night. I explained the beeping and the doors and then he asked me about the graffiti. I told him I didn't know what he was talking about and he pulled out his phone and had me scroll through a series of photos. He explained that in every classroom of that building, something was painstakingly drawn on the whiteboard. Some of the drawings were variations of the same word while others were complex images that looked like hieroglyphics. The word, written in dozens of different forms and languages, was Asmodeus. Jared explained that this was the name of an ancient Persian demon that predated the Bible and the Talmud. Now, I've never been very religious, so I don't know what to make of all that, but I will say this. Whatever entity lurks inside that building, I hope to never encounter it again. This first takes place when I was 14, the second was when I was 22. When I was in high school, I had a best friend named Andrew and my cousin Joseph. We did everything together and hung out often. They lived near each other on a bad part of town, but I'd often go visit them every week and we'd walk to a park that was nearby to hang out and just talk about life. Next to the old park was a sort of maintenance tunnel that had two entrances leading towards under the ground where the park was. Shallow water ran out from them and into a creek, and the tunnels were made of concrete, and the entrances on both sides were square. Outside had a concrete ramp sloping down towards them, and one day we decided to sit down on them and look into the tunnels. We noticed graffiti on the left one above a corner that said, This way to hell. 
Being young and thinking we were brave, we wanted to go see what was down there. The ceiling was low, so you had to crouch to walk in there, and we got about ten feet in and realized that we went further and we wouldn't be able to see anything, so we planned on getting flashlights and going back later. Our moms bought us some cheap ones that could barely shine, so we made it just a little further than last time, but we could see some of the graffiti inside, and one said, Run, boys and girls. As you got further down the corner, going toward the right and before it did, there was a final warning that read, You're halfway to hell now, with an arrow pointing in the direction of the turn. At that point, we couldn't see anything around the corner, so we said that we'd save up for some good flashlights and come back way later. And about a week later, I get to class and my cousin, who usually jokes often with me, looks a bit shaken up. He was quiet and didn't say much, and I finally asked him what was wrong, and he hesitated to tell me, but finally said, Me and Andrew went into the tunnel yesterday by ourselves. My mom bought me a powerful flashlight, and I ran ahead of Andrew, and when I got to the corner, I turned, and the light shined on something. It was black and big, and when the light hit its back, it turned its head towards me and stood up all the way. He had a serious expression on his face, and I could tell that he wasn't joking. I wanted to believe him, but Andrew had a bad habit of lying, and I figured maybe Joseph and him were just trying to prank me. We didn't go into the tunnels for a while. One day, I went to stay over at Andrew's, and he invited a girl over from class to hang out. We told her about the creepy tunnel, and she wanted to see it. So, we went there when it was dark, and... Her being braver than both of us kept getting ahead of us, and Andrew tried to warn her, practically begging her to slow down. We turned the corner and proceeded to go down it, and this part of the tunnel was longer, and even with three flashlights it was difficult to see much. There was no graffiti down it, just shallow water. We got to a wall that had a smaller, circular hole that led down further, and just before that the ceiling arched upwards. We stood up to stretch our backs, me being six feet four inches, I was able to stand up all the way with my head still not hitting the top. As we stretched, it suddenly hit me that Joseph had said about seeing something stand up at the end of the tunnel, a part that neither of us had reached before until now, and I looked at Andrew and said, Joseph wasn't lying. We got out and went back to Andrew's. We told Joseph what had happened, and at this point, although we were scared, it was still something scary to show others. And he called one morning to tell me his cousin stayed over the night before and that after telling him, his cousin wanted to see it, but not to go in, just to see where it was. Joseph's mom was a little strict on him leaving past a certain time of night, so when she fell asleep, they snuck out in the middle of the night to go see it. When they arrived, Joseph said that they walked down the concrete ramp and heard voices, like multiple people talking from down the tunnel. He went to get closer and stepped into the water, and when he heard voices and a commotion saying, Someone's here. Then splashing from down the tunnel as multiple footsteps began running through, making it echo. He said him and his cousin ran all the way back to his house, afraid that someone might have seen or even followed them. He got his grandpa's rifle and kept it by him, not knowing what to expect, but nothing ever happened. And one night I was at home, and my aunt Priscilla came over. So it was me, my sister Renee, my aunt, and my sister's friend Erica, and a friend of mine named Michael, and we started telling scary stories, and I brought up the tunnel. My aunt asked where it was and offered to drive over because she wanted to see it, and this got everyone's interest. I went outside to tell my dad where we were going, and he told me that incidents happened there with kids when he lived in that neighborhood, and my dad told tall tales, so I didn't really believe a word he said, but... To my surprise, he handed me a pocket knife if I insisted on going in there. We show up and Erica says that she's staying in the car. I called Andrew and Joseph and asked if they would want to go with us in a big group, I guess safety in numbers, and since we didn't see anything last time, I figured it would be smart. They walked over and we all went in. As we got to the corner and turned, my sister started to get ahead of me by a few feet. I was trying to catch up while holding the light ahead to shine with hers when I saw the light reflect off of something dark. I immediately stopped and started to tell Renee to get back. She either didn't hear me or didn't care and took two more steps and shined the light upon what 
I had mine aimed at. Something crouched down, with its back turned at first, turned its head back to us and stood up. The skin was solid black and the light seemed to shine off of it, almost glistening. From what I could tell, it was massive and the head near the ceiling as it was where the roof arched upwards. The thing I could clearly see were its red eyes. Just two embers in the dark staring down at us. I'd never heard my sister scream like that. Just pure, guttural terror in her voice. She turns to run past me, pushing my arm, yelling at me to run. My entire body locked up from fear, but she didn't see that I was still behind and kept running. I'd never been so scared that my body refused to move. I panicked and grabbed my leg, forcing it to budge, and then the other, too afraid to look up, but was imagining that this thing was heading my way. As soon as my legs could move, I turned and ran faster than I'd ever ran in my life. I ended up being the first person out of the tunnel, although the rest of the group, including my sister, were ahead of me, and we agreed to never go in again. A couple of months later, me and Andrew planned on going to the park to hang out and saw a birthday party was happening, so I suggested that we go into the entrance of the tunnel where the light from the sun was still visible, just to have a little bit of privacy and talk and not be near anyone. He was hesitant at first, but agreed, as I told him that I wasn't going anywhere near the darkness. We got a little ways in, and the uneven ground elevated near a spot, making the water run around it, creating a dry spot, and we sat down and began talking for a bit until we heard some kids from the party come down to the entrance and ask us what we were doing. We tried to encourage them to go back, and when they insisted on staying to ask questions, I told Andrew, let's get out, I don't want them coming down here. We went to leave, and as we came out, we saw a man telling the kids to go back, and he turned and looked at us and asked, what were y'all doing down there? I told him that we were just talking and hanging out, and his face turned very serious, and he asked, did you see anything down there? I felt my heart begin to pound. This is a complete stranger that we had never seen before, and I tried to pretend that I didn't know and asked, what thing? in a quiet voice, and he began to raise his voice and said, That thing, that big black no-name thing, did you see it? We stayed quiet until I finally asked, How do you know about that? And he responds, Let me tell you something, man. When me and my friends were your age, we thought we were brave and cool and went down there too. You ain't got no business going down those tunnels, you hear me? He was getting angry, although we weren't arguing, this is until he began to yell, and Andrew began to backtalk and tell him that he didn't need to listen to him, and Andrew was short and stocky, and me being a pretty tall teenager, I was really too scared to say anything. The man threatened to take Andrew down to the tunnel and kill him, and something about the way he said it made me feel that he was pretty serious. Suddenly a man from the party drunk, came down to the area and went to unzip his pants and relieve himself in the water away from us and said, Man, where'd you go? We were looking for you. And the other man replied, I'm just talking to these kids. And the drunk man asked him to hurry up and went back to the birthday party. The man turned back to us and pointed a finger at us and said, I'm serious. Stay out of those tunnels. Then walked off without waiting for a reply. Andrew finally expressed how scared he was, but didn't want to show the man, so tried to be brave and talk back, and we went to his house and made us promise that day to never go there again. Years later, in my late twenties, I told some friends, and I agreed to go show them the entrance. The graffiti warning was still there. Trees had overgrown, covering the top of the entrance with hanging limbs and leaves, and a gate was installed blocking the entryway to both sides with a sign that said, No Trespassing. I'm not sure why it was installed, as I hadn't seen it in years, but to this day, at age 36, it still gives me the creeps to think about our experience in there, and how foolish we were just because we wanted to be young and dumb. I still have no idea what we saw that day. I've only shared this story with a few people, but 
Even now, when I think about it, it freaks me out. I was around 16 years old growing up in a small town where exploring the hills was the thing to do. This incident took place at the north end of Ruby Valley in Elko County, Nevada. Someday I'll play around on Google Earth and try to find this place, but it's slightly north of the road off of Highway 93 that goes into Ruby Valley. I always like checking out old mine shafts and ghost towns. That kind of stuff really intrigues me. At the Burger Bar in Wells, Nevada, where I'm from and grew up, they had these old turn-of-the-century maps under glass on the tables. On one of them, it showed several ghost towns just north of Ruby Valley, so I figured that I would go check them out. As I hadn't been in the area very often, I gassed up my 72 Dodge W200 pickup. Being a redneck and slash K before 4chan even, I grabbed my HK91 and set out. I found some old foundations in the lower country and started heading into the mountains themselves. I started finding abandoned mine shafts and it was pretty cool so I kept going up. I took this ancient road that was no more than an overgrown cattle path by this point in history and came upon a tree blocking the road. It was an old pinyon pine, also two feet in diameter, that blocked the road. After the tree, the road continued straight for about 200 yards, then hooked right before coming back 180 degrees. I parked my truck in front of the tree and set out on foot. I grabbed my HK-91 with one 20-round magazine and the rifle and put another 20-round mag in my back left pocket. I always had my rifle with me. I've encountered mountain lions and mine shafts before, and just generally I like to shoot stuff, get up on the ridge lines, and shoot boulders from a couple of hundred yards away. And anyways, as soon as I climbed over the fallen tree, I had a creepy feeling as if though I was being watched. I continued on for about 200 yards to the point where the road started carving right and gaining elevation towards the cabin. At this point... I realized not only did I feel like I was being watched, but it was also dead quiet. This was in June, so everywhere else you went you could hear those cicadas, but not here. It seemed as soon as I crossed the fallen tree the mountains were silent. No bugs, no birds, nothing. Just deafening silence. As I came up to the turn there was this big rock about 15 feet in diameter. It used to be on the road, but due to the years of erosion and snow, it had slid down just slightly off the road. It seemed to be red limestone or something like that, which stood out since they are not that common in this area. I looked at the rock, and you could tell that there were carvings in it at some point in time, and due to weathering, whatever was carved on it had been worn off. I kept walking up the road feeling incredibly creeped out, but I really wanted to check out that old cabin. It was obvious that no one had been there for quite a while. At this point, I was probably three hours off-road to get to this point, and I got up to the cabin, and as far as abandoned houses and cabins in Nevada go, this one was in pretty good shape. All the glass in the window was still intact, and there were remnants of curtains behind the windows. In the back of my mind, something told me that I should be leaving. I went inside the cabin, and that's when I started to get the feeling that something was off. Most cabins you find out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada are barren, with maybe a bit of broken furniture. This one was different. It was completely furnished. Time had taken its toll, but everything was still there. What was left of an old mattress and bedding, plates and other cookware throughout the house, along with tattered clothing and personal effects like a chest, faded pictures, and the like. What really creeped me out was the dinner table. It was set for four people. Ten plates, glasses, and silverware. And this was the first cabin I had ever found in this condition. It was as if though whoever resided here had just up and left everything behind. I felt like I shouldn't be in the cabin and went outside to see if I could find the mine shaft or anything else. And once I was out the door, I decided to chamber around in my HK-91. The sound of me racking around echoed throughout the canyon and broke the silence. As little of a thing as it was, this calmed my nerves very slightly. Directly behind the cabin was a well, and it was still intact. As I got closer, I heard noises coming from it, like a slight breeze rustling through it. When I got within about 30 feet of it, I started to smell something. It was absolutely putrid. Definitely something had died in that well. 
The smell of decay was heavy in the air with an acrid copper scent that tore at my nostrils. I didn't want to get any closer to the well and started walking towards the left where I could see the opening to a mine shaft up on the hill. The closer I got to it, the more I felt a breeze coming out of it. This is not really uncommon if you've explored mine shafts before as the breeze could be coming in from another opening for the mine, but the thing was, it was perfectly calm as far as I could see, there were no trees moving or any signs of wind. As I got closer, another thing struck me as odd. The breeze coming from out of the shaft was hot. Most of the time it was cool as most mine shafts maintain a constant temperature. The closer I got to the shaft, the slower I moved towards it. Nothing since I crossed the fallen tree seemed right. The closer I got to the opening of the mine shaft, the more of a feeling of dread and being watched that I got. And I got within about 15 feet of the shaft when the smell hit me. It was the smell of decay and copper, but much stronger than the well. Right then, all of my spidey senses started going off. I had to get out of there. I started turning left to run when I saw a dark shadow moving in the opening of the mine shaft. Whatever it was, it appeared to be crouched down to fit in the mine shaft, and most mine shafts I've been in have 8 to 10 foot ceilings. At first I thought it was a mountain lion, and then I remembered how big the shafts were. My mind raced trying to think what it could be. It was too big to be a black bear, which are rare in northeast Nevada. I nearly froze with panic and then it slowly kept coming towards the opening of the mine shaft. It was probably within ten feet of the opening and the light was starting to show whatever it was. It was covered from head to toe in grayish brown fur. And then it screamed. It was unlike anything I had ever heard in my life. My ears were ringing from it. I flipped into panic mode and did what any good redneck would do. I shot at it. I pulled up my HK-91, placed the front blade on what appeared to be the center mass, and ripped off five rounds as fast as I could accurately shoot. If you've ever shot big game with a large caliber rifle, you know the sound when you connect with something. I had four solid hits and one round that went high and this made it scream even louder than it had in pain. At this time, I started hearing more and separate screams coming from over in the well and in the hills above the mine shaft. I started running down the hill as fast as I could. In the tree line above the road, approximately 75 to 125 yards, I could see fast movement. Rocks were tumbling down the hill, and there were several other screams from the mine shaft. I could hear the wailing of whatever I had shot, Whatever it was, I had definitely connected, and it was hurting. Up in the tree line, they were running from tree to tree on all fours, getting closer to me as I ran towards the rock. I was shooting in the general vicinity of the movement on the top of the hill, and by the time I got to the limestone rock, I had expended the 20-round mag in the rifle. I ripped it out and put in my spare magazine, chambered around, and started spraying towards the fallen tree approximately 200 yards away. By now I kept glancing back and whatever they were, they were staying in the trees. I could make out their masses and fur but they wouldn't stay in the open. I got back to the fallen tree and ate dirt trying to jump over it. I got up, fired between 12 to 15 rounds at the closest movement which was approximately 50 yards away from me. I heard a few rounds connect and it started screaming louder. Between the screaming and gunshots my ears were damn near deaf. I opened the door of my truck, got in, and started up as fast as I could. Backing up to turn around, I dang near put my truck down in the canyon, and as I started going forward to leave on the road that I came in on, I finally got a look at one of them. It was crouched over with its front feet on the tree. It was covered from head to toe in grayish brown fur with long slender fingers with claws tipping off the fingers. The back of it was hunched and the face was slender, most closely resembling that of a badger but with sunken in eyes. It was shaking its head back and forth and it sounded like it was attempting to speak but it was so garbled and with the noise of my truck I couldn't make out what it was. I averaged 50 to 60 miles per hour on this terrible dirt road that I had done 15 on the way in. I didn't slow down or stop until I got back to pavement and by now I was so shaken that I had to stop and collect myself. I got back to town and 
was in a bit of shock. My dad had been a guide in the Ruby Mountains for about 20 years. He asked me how my trip went and where I had been. He could tell that I was startled and asked where I had been, and I told him that I had been north of Ruby Valley. He got quiet and asked if I had seen a cabin with a tree fallen over the road. I told him yes. He looked me in the eyes and told me that it was somewhere that I should never go again, especially alone. We never spoke about it again after that. I tried researching it a bit and a few years had passed and I asked some old timers and one of them told me a story about the Ruby Mountains and I'll make it quick. You see, during the 40s and 50s, the Army Air Corps operated out of the Wendover Air Base. Every now and then, during bad weather, a B-25, B-17, or B-29 would crash into the Rubies due to poor visibility. Some of the local ranchers got recruited to help the military go up to a crash site during the winter to recover the bodies. A rancher I was talking to told me that it took them about three days to get up to where the crash was on horseback and recover the bodies. He said that when they got to the wreckage, all of the crew members were laid out side by side next to each other in a clearing in the wreckage. Many of them had severed limbs and it was apparent that they all died on impact. Somehow they ended up laid out next to each other and this was at nearly 10,000 feet elevation as well. I have never been back there. Part of the reason is I live in western Nevada now. But in the back of my mind there is something that's telling me that I should go back. And one day I do want to go back there. Now this was back in 2001 before camera phones and I was too broke to afford any sort of digital stuff. And I want to go back with a camera. Preferably a GoPro on my helmet and with several friends that are armed. There's just something about there. Even with all the stuff that I experienced that day that's drawing me back. And one day I will go. I guess I just need closure on what happened that day. The events described in this story happened about a month and a half ago in Shenandoah, West Virginia. Although I typed this up about two weeks ago, I just haven't really had the guts to post this until what happened yesterday. The story starts in late September when my family went to visit our relatives who invited us to celebrate one of them winning 2,000 bucks in some scratch-off lottery thing. They live in this really run-down part of Shenandoah that people from Charleston, Shepherdston, and Ranson, which is basically the least rednecky part of West Virginia, like to call the Squalor Holler. It's way up on the mountain and exactly like how everyone pictures it when they hear about it. Nothing but ramshackle shacks, rusty rebuilt trailers, everything covered in decades-old Christmas decorations because they're all too busy being smelly rednecks to ever really clean up. Real deliverance stuff, just no rivers or canoes. The relatives we're visiting are actually all cousins intermarrying. We don't refer to them as aunt, uncle, or whatever, just relatives. They're not terrible people or anything, just absolute cartoonish, depressing hillbilly stereotypes. So anyway, we're up here in this godforsaken trailer, and it sucks. There are like eight of them, plus me, my dad, my mom, and my sister. About two hours in, my mom takes my cell phone so that I can focus on family time together, which is frustrating. All we did the whole time was eat TV dinners and be forced to watch NASCAR and stuff. And after about six hours of this, about ten minutes before we're supposed to leave, it starts raining. We know now how treacherous the roads can be up on the mountains, so we decide to wait for the rain to die down. Flash forward to two hours later. It's dark, ten o'clock, and there's a flood warning for the area. I have my phone back by this time, but no reception, of course. I'm playing Tetris and Texas Hold'em and stuff when I suddenly hear my dad start losing his mind in the next room. I walk over and it turns out that they let slip that they buried their kid, Thomas, outside. Apparently they were afraid the rain would wash up his body or something. The kid was like six and he was attacked by a dog and they never called the cops. They just buried him like he was some sort of family pet. My dad's flipping out, and rightfully so, because, you know, we live in the 21st century and all. So our relatives say that they'll sort it out in the morning. My parents tell me and my sister to stay in the same room as them during the night, and we do. None of us really suspected that they'd killed Thomas or anything, since they're really peaceful. 
They didn't even own any guns aside from the one old-timey double-barrel shotgun they had on the mantel. Nevertheless, we were creeped out and intended to call the cops in the morning once we got to town. It was like three in the morning. I couldn't sleep and the power had gone out for the fifth time or so. The worst part is I could see Thomas's little grave right outside the window, like a cross on it and everything. I assumed the kid couldn't have been buried deep at all since they were so worried about him just washing out of the grave, so I was just fixated on it, kept being drawn to looking out the window. And then, I saw the worst thing in my life. Something was creeping through the trees towards the house. I stared at it for a while but couldn't get a good look at it since it was raining and the brush was so thick. For a few minutes I assumed it was two really pale horses kind of ambling toward the woods side by side, but then it walked into the moonlight and I saw that it was all one thing, like a kind of human torso but wider. It finally stepped into full view and I saw that it had something like six legs, kind of somewhere between a beetle's legs and a horse's legs, two arms right where someone would normally have them but they were about half a foot longer than a normal man's arms. It had a bald head, but the face looked like some sort of bizarre masquerade ball kind of mask with a clenched up furrowed forehead and a nose that looked sort of like a crow's or a raven's beak. It didn't have any eyes either, just depressions where eyes would go. It looked like it had a human mouth underneath its proboscis, and what still strikes me to this day is that it seemed to have a human male part, if you know what I mean, right on the abdomen where a normal person's would be. The thing moved sort of gracefully and made those soft thumping noises when it moved, and it must have been like seven or eight feet tall but sounded like it weighed only 150 pounds at most. It started walking towards Thomas's grave, and then I finally snapped out of whatever trance I was in and just screamed. My mom was the first to wake up, and I told her to look out the window. She rushed over and didn't really seem to understand what she was looking at. After a minute, though, the thing bent down and started pawing at the grave with its hands. My dad and Jasper rushed in, and Jasper just lost his mind, screamed like a little girl, and ran back out of the room yelling for his father, yelling, It's outside. It came, and it's outside. I looked back and saw the thing digging furiously at the ground, kicking up huge mounds of mud. I heard these sounds of feet running around the house, and I think they were looking for that shotgun. The thing reached into the hole and grabbed up what I assumed was Thomas's body by the leg in one hand. The thing kind of galloped back into the woods, snapping all those branches. And that's when I heard it. A kid crying. The sound of a child sobbing and crying from the direction the thing took off in. We left as soon as the rain let up at like 5 a.m., I don't even think we told anyone at the house, and we drove straight back to Ranson, only stopping for gas. No one said a word to each other, and my family refuses to speak about what happened. I tried to bring it up once just to make sure that it was real, and my dad told me to shut up, so I did. I've always had an overactive imagination. I'm an artist and I'm diagnosed with ADHD as a child, though I was never medicated. So my mind was constantly everywhere and I was always drawing and fooling around as a kid. My imagination would do terrible things to me sometimes though, probably as a result of watching horror movies at a young age, scary stuff lurking around every corner. But on one occasion, I knew it wasn't just my imagination. I was in 6th grade at the time, probably 12 or so, and I lived in a very small town off a major highway. Seriously small. The only significant thing in this town burnt down about 20 years ago, and then a kid died in the high school, so it was condemned. The only things here now are a cemetery, a lake, a post office, and a gas station, all within about four blocks of the town. Another strange thing about this town is that it was booming in the early 90s, but now it's a dusty, literal ghost town with about 40 people living here, and people who never speak or even really go outside. The only other kids were my best friends, and there were only three of us. Every morning we walked together to the bus stop, and most mornings none of us spoke really. 
One morning, it was foggier than usual, but I remember it was cold and a little misty outside. My uncle, who is now deceased, grew up here, and he always told me messed up stories about this town. He told me to watch myself. Strange things were always going on here. But he was kind of loony, so I didn't really worry about it most of the time. However, this morning felt kind of off. I wasn't too stressed because I knew the others would be waking up soon enough, and when they didn't, I started to freak out. I stood alone at the bus stop and my imagination started going wild. I was in the middle of imagining a set of eyes in the mist about ten feet away from me when I saw something walking. This was absolutely real, and I remember every detail. It was a man in shape and stature, but the way he walked seriously made my bones feel numb, slow and rhythmic, almost like he was floating. My twelve-year-old eyes bulged out of my skull, and I remembered freezing in terror. I can't even stop shaking while I'm currently typing this. And then he looked at me, looked directly at me. His eyes, they were so far apart. They were almost on the sides of his head, which were oblong, like a sideways egg, but not that long. And he had a small nose in the center, absolutely hairless, with crooked, jagged yellow teeth underneath a disgusting smile. I've read a ton of creepypasta threads and heard almost exact descriptions of ghouls, and I've wondered if maybe they saw who or what I saw, but it's never the same. He didn't leave me until the headlights of the school bus came over the hill. And then, without taking his eyes off of me, he raised one hand and waved. Not like a goodbye wave, more like a see-you-around wave. And then he walked slowly away from the spot he stood, which felt almost like a small eternity. When the bus pulled up, I was crying. I don't know why, I don't remember what triggered it, but the driver had to call the school, who called my mom, and she came and picked me up. I tried telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. She said it was probably just a guy in a mask messing with me. I knew it wasn't. I know it wasn't because for the next five years of my life, he was there, watching me, and almost enjoying our time together. For the first few months, his appearance sent me into a terrible frenzy of crying and screaming. My mom, who was single most of my childhood, worked second and third shifts to keep our house, so she was never there at night or in the afternoon to watch me. I never had anyone to tell. I was frightened and alone so much, but whenever I would see him, I would call my grandma and talk to her on the phone, hoping that he would see this and think that I was talking to the cops or something. I don't know, I was 12 or 13. I would shut the blinds and watch TV and try not to think about it. And he would only make appearances like once a week, so it wasn't an everyday kind of thing. And then at some point I realized that he never came near me or touched me or anything. He just stood watching me, whether it be outside my windows or in the cornfield just beyond the fence at the school playground. I got used to him and after a while, he was nothing more than scenery. When I would go on trips or vacations, he wasn't there. It was only around this small town. On one instance, when I was 15 or 16, I was on a walk with a friend of mine. We were walking near the edge of town where the paved road turns into gravel and the cemetery sits next to the graveyard. And that's when I saw him again. The being that I had taken to calling a skinwalker. He was about a hundred yards away, leaning casually against a gravestone. I asked my friend while keeping my eye on Skinwalker, want to go into the graveyard? And he was down, so we went in. It had become obvious to me that Skinwalker wasn't noticed by anyone other than myself, so it wasn't a shock that when I walked almost directly next to him, my buddy was oblivious. I remember that was the closest I'd ever seen him. He was so much more detailed this close. His skin, I'll never forget it. It was almost translucent. He wasn't just pale, he was old and he was staring directly into my eyes. His eyes, they were green, but dark, not completely black, and I remember it was a green with a hint of yellow and brown, and I remember he had what I would describe as pretty eyes, but they were so beady and far apart. I had forgotten all about my friend when he said, why are you staring at that gravestone? I looked at him and then the skinwalker, but he wasn't there anymore just an old, weathered slab of tall concrete. I looked at it for a second, then noticed a name. Blankety-blank, 1846-1847. to 1847. 
I paid no attention to this for a long time until I noticed that every time I was in the graveyard, there he was, same pose, same stone, watching me. And one day, I was reading a book on the paranormal when I thought about something. Maybe he was just a ghost, and maybe he wanted me to help him, so I came up with a plan. I rode my bike to the graveyard. I don't know why, at the time I thought that it might make a quicker getaway if he tried to get me or something. I don't know. Anyway, I approached him, standing there as usual, and I said, Can you hear me? And he just looked blank-faced and no response. If you need my help, tell me. Then he seemed to get angry. I don't remember exactly what happened. All I remember was that I ran. I ran and didn't look back until I was back on my bike. And then when I got on my bike, he was standing there, still at the gravestone, with one arm stretched out towards me, like he was reaching for me to come back, or like he was sorry or something. I don't know. I didn't stick around much longer to find out, and I rode as fast as I could home, and... That was the last time I saw him for a while. A few months went by and I started to get really anxious, avoiding being alone, avoiding going outside after dark. I was so scared that I would see him again, but at the same time I felt bad, like I shouldn't have upset him. I felt sorry for him. I don't know, it was weird, but I almost felt like we were friends at this point, and I still feel like we're friends. The first time I saw him again was while I was riding the bus to school. I no longer had to walk to the bus stop. I was in high school, but I knew that it was him. He was walking or dancing down the sidewalk, but it was only a quick glance. He watched me go past him, and I knew that he knew that I was on, and that was it. His appearances became less and less frequent until one night, the last night I'd ever see him. I was 17 years old, and my mom announced that we were moving. Things had gotten serious with her boyfriend, and we were moving in with him. Our boxes were being packed and the house was on the market. It was about midnight and I was alone in the house as usual. I was drawing in my living room. I had my supplies laid out in front of me and I was going to town on the paper when I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. But this was a first. He was now in my house. And my first reaction was to scream and he took a step back. I remember this as being a very strange moment. It was quiet and he seemed scared. We watched each other for a moment and then I realized that I didn't have anything to fear and I went back to drawing. He moved about for a moment and wound up standing behind me. It was like he wanted to watch me draw. So I remember letting him and he moved in front of me and he stood there looking, not at me, but at my sketches. I'm not sure how long this lasted but at some point I realized that he must have wanted me to draw him. And so I did. I started slowly, but eventually it was normal. I just sat completely silent, drawing this being, this messed up thing that followed me for damn near five years, and when I was done, I held my notebook up and he seemed to be happy, ecstatic actually. His smile seemed bigger and his eyes seemed kinder, and I'm pretty sure I smiled too and he liked it. I have absolutely no idea how long we stayed that way, but eventually he turned away from me and walked into the other room, and then he was gone. Forever. My mom and I moved and went on with our lives. I'm 20 now and living on my own. I wish with everything inside of me that I hadn't left that notebook with my mother because it's probably in storage somewhere now. I'd also like to say this. Every year since I moved, I go back to the gravestone and leave flowers. And every year I've hoped to see him standing there and I plan on doing this until I die. I moved to Kentucky for the fire service, buying 10 square miles of hilly forest with a home at an auction. The old owner had lived there his whole life and died on the land. His family sold it to make a quick buck, and I started planting more trees. The forest was dense, but could use more, especially around the house. I put up trail cams because of homeless wanderers coming onto the property. Something was getting angry and ripping down the trail cams from behind, including one high up in the trees. I found piles of them in tree hollows. I grabbed my shotgun and camping supplies and headed out to find the homeless guy and persuade him into leaving my property and I couldn't find anyone. 
only tiny four-toed prints in the mud by the streams. I thought it was a raccoon, but the spacing made me think that it was standing up. I made camp and hunkered down, cooking up some tasty rabbit stew, and I got into the tent and went to sleep before cleaning the pot because I was too tired. I woke up at around three in the morning with the moon shining through the trees. I heard weird grunting noises from outside the tent, and they sounded almost small. I opened up the window flap and the stew pot was swinging, but I couldn't see anything near it except for a mossy rock about the size of a gallon jug that I hadn't noticed before. I thought nothing of it and went back to sleep. I woke up and went over to the stew pot to cook some breakfast. It had been licked clean and the mossy rock was gone. I assumed raccoons must have cleaned it in the middle of the night and the rock was the lump that did it. I packed up and searched some, but I couldn't find anyone. However, I swore the moss around me was alive. Rocks seemed to move whenever I looked away from them. I didn't have a sense of dread or anything, just sort of a weird feeling. And somewhere in my search I lost my knife, which I'd had for a while. It was cheap, but it had sentimental value to me. And I got home, tired and bummed out from not finding anyone and losing my knife and went to sleep immediately. I woke up to a light knocking at my door. I got up kind of groggy and opened the door, eyeing where I kept my gun just in case. I peeked through the window and no one was there. I grabbed my shotgun, opened the door and poked my head through in case it was someone visiting their new neighbor. Again, no one, only forest noises and the occasional butterfly. I stepped through the door and felt my foot kick something. I looked down and my knife was laying there on a small bed of flowers in the grass. I looked around, really confused but happy that someone found my knife, and then I felt anger that someone was on my property and watching me. I shouted out as loud as I could, a quick thanks, and invited them to come see me so I could talk to them. I noticed about three rocks, all around the size and shape of a jug of milk, in a row just on the border of the forest. I picked up my knife and walked back inside. When I glanced outside, the rocks were gone. A month later, since finding my knife on the porch, I was planting more trees and working the land to make a small garden. A puppy named Hugo was walking around, sniffing things and doing puppy stuff while I tilled. I noticed two rocks on the edge of the forest, and I thought nothing of it. They didn't bother me, and I didn't bother them. I was getting used to it and expecting them by now. Honestly, I didn't feel afraid, and Hugo didn't seem to mind them. I started to get really into my garden, losing track of time, and looked up to find Hugo to take him inside with me for a break. Hugo was gone. I panicked because I loved that little guy, and I looked around frantically and saw him by the edge of the forest, sniffing one of the rocks. The rock he was sniffing shifted a little when his nose got too close to it, and I ran over to Hugo to keep him from getting hurt or something in case a rock tipped over on top of him. And that's when I saw the moss on the rock shift and sprout out a tiny, spindly little arm. I stopped walking for a second and blinked to make sure that I wasn't seeing things. It was hot and humid and I hadn't been drinking as much water as I should have. The arm continued to extend slowly and tentatively towards Hugo, recoiling a little whenever Hugo's nose touched it. I stood back up cautiously to not spook the rock thing. It was getting nearer to Hugo, about 50 yards away, and I saw that it was petting Hugo's head. Hugo was wagging his tail and generally seemed to be enjoying it. I got about 10 yards away when I stepped on a twig and made a loud noise, and the creature's arm shot back into its body and the rock started tumbling frantically away. Hugo ran after them and I ran after Hugo. I lost sight of my dog and searched for him until nightfall. I went back to my house to grab a flashlight and my camping gear to find my pupper, and as I got closer I saw a white and black lump on the porch. I started running towards my house and as I got closer, I saw that it was Hugo. He was lying on the porch, not moving. I got upset as I got closer, and I saw red and pink around his head and neck and I started sprinting, thinking my dog was hurt or dead. I got ten feet away, about to bound up onto the porch when Hugo's head jerked up and he looked at me. He stood up and came to greet me with a slobbering mouth, clearly happy to see me. 
He had a little crown of red and pink flowers around his head and neck and a rope tied to his collar in my door. I hugged him, tears welling up because I'd come to love this pupper so much, and I stood up and shouted a thank you to whoever brought him home and then went in and went to sleep. I've been on this property now for about four years and have a lot more stories about them if people are still interested. I've gotten very close to them and am trying to build up my trust with the little things. About a year later I kept seeing the rocks around my house and they were getting closer and closer and I noticed one was living in my garden now, a little different from the others, greenish gray and very round, almost spherical. And every now and then I would take a peek out the window and caught a glimpse of it moving around very slowly and methodically. The garden has never looked more beautiful since it moved in. I go out to my garden often and see it on the opposite side for me all the time, and I decided one day to go up to it and try to show it that I meant no harm. I was unsuccessful. It just tucked its arms and legs in whenever it saw me, and it looked like a chubby sloth carved out of stone, but it had no mouth or nose from what I could tell, just two beady little eyes. I decided to leave it alone. It seemed to be helping me with the garden, and I appreciated that and sometimes some of my veggies would be gone or half-eaten and sitting by the stone. I let it have them and left some veggies near the edge of the forest one day and I noticed that the stone was gone and the veggies were no longer being eaten. The garden was looking a little worse for wear and the stones were gone from the tree line. I was genuinely sad that they were gone. About two weeks later I went into the forest looking for them. I came to the middle of my property where a massive tree had fallen. It was some kind of oak probably around a hundred feet tall. When I got closer, I noticed that there were dozens of the stones on and around it, all leaning on it like they were kissing it or resting their heads on it. And I was overwhelmed with a sudden sense of sadness, almost like a family member had died. I walked over to the tree and placed my hand on it, whispering some sweet nothings to the stones. I went back home after spending almost three hours at the tree, feeling bereft of an old friend, and for some reason I remember that I had a white oak sapling in my yard outside my house, and I dug it up and took it to the bigger oak in the forest the next day with Hugo. I planted it next to the fallen oak so that it would replace the giant hole the older one had left. Hugo was walking around and I caught a glimpse of a few stones petting him, and a few days later I noticed the stones were back on the edge of the forest. The garden stone was back and everything looked lush and vibrant again. I have one other notable story that was kind of scary, I guess. Well, not really scary, but it does involve a crazy homeless guy. I went out to the forest one day with Hugo to look around for bums, say hi to some friends, and just be outdoors. I noticed more and more signs of a homeless person living here. Trash everywhere, broken branches and plants, etc. And finally I made it to where I thought the guy was camping. I found a shelter and took it down, but I neatly folded it for him so he could get off my property quickly. It was starting to get dark, and I was getting a little worried that I might have made him angry, or he was dead somewhere on my property. I saw someone moving deeper into the forest and shouted out to him to stop and talk to me. The guy had a pickaxe, so I kept my shotgun ready in case he got violent. I saw that he was smashing something with it and started to freak out, thinking that I had stumbled onto a killing, and that's when I heard the unmistakable sound of rocks being smashed. I fired into the air, getting his attention quickly. He dropped his pickaxe and put his hands up, mumbling something unintelligible. My adrenaline was pumping, I was shaking and Hugo was going mad on his leash. I screamed at him about smashing the rocks. He started saying how they were following him and throwing stuff at him, and I almost shot him then and there, but instead, I led him at gunpoint to the edge of my property and told him to get out and never come back. And a few days later, I got a call from the sheriff's office about a body they found near my property, a homeless guy beaten to death and stuffed into a tree. They told me a deputy would be coming to talk to me, and the deputy showed up about an hour later and questioned me about it if I had any interactions with the homeless guy. I told him no, and he started to leave, and then turned around on my porch and mentioned my stone fence was a little low, but looked good. I looked around and saw the entire edge of the forest around my house was surrounded by stones. 
I thanked him and saw him get into his cruiser. He left and I looked back at my house, and all the stones were gone except for two. I had a lot of small ones, like gifts and whatnot, and they left me flowers sometimes, moral mushrooms and things I've lost. I've been giving them about a third of my veggies, and they seem to like that. More and more of them show up in my yard rather than my tree line, and they only seem to move when they don't notice me there. They're very slow moving, and the only time I've ever seen them move quickly is when they roll. I have a lot more animals in my area now, and the forest and the yard slash garden are much more lush and green. When they're around, they seem to disappear during storms. I think they either go into tree hollows or patiently wait it out under other kinds of cover. The garden rock likes to go into a small covered trellis that I built for it when the rain comes. I've never heard them speak and I've only seen their faces a few times. It's just an oblong rock with beady black eyes that looks like polished black glass, very spindly arms and legs. Not bony looking but more vine like that they tuck back onto the body and aren't noticeable. They have four toes and three fingers and a thumb. The bodies are shaped like a bullet and they're about the size of a gallon jug. The garden rock is more round though. Their heads sit on the front of the body rather than on top and kind of blend into it. The eyes are wide spaced, almost parallel to each other and about the size of a small marble. They're covered in moss and can range from green to burgundy and I think that might indicate age but I don't know. When they stand up and walk they look hunched over and they tend to wobble more than just walk with arms out like they're carrying something under them. There were a couple of things left in the house before I moved in, like some personal documents, mostly health records, and other than that I know the guy came from Holland and he built the house when he was over 50. None of his family wanted the land, they just seemed to want to make some quick cash. I did let them spread his ashes in the forest though because that's where he spent most of his time with his wife and her ashes were also spread out there according to their daughter. He seemed like a sweet old man, he liked woodcrafting and I found some of his stuff here and there in the basement in the shop. I left a figure out that he made on the porch and the next day it was gone. I'm not sure if the little stone people took it or if it was some other animal passing through. So this is my first post on 4chan ever. I'm kind of weirded out because sometimes I come here to read stories when I'm bored, but this thread really hit home. I'm not a big believer in the supernatural, but I had one instance in my life that freaked me out. It is eerily similar to several other stories that I've read here describing skinwalkers. It happened in a place called Miracle Mile, or around there in the state of Wyoming. My family was living in Montana for work and we took a camping trip with another family. I'll tell the whole story in the next post once I know this is how you respond to a post and believe me when I say that this is my first ever post on 4chan and it looks like it worked. Feel free to ask me any questions as this will take some time to type the full story. You see it was summer of 1998 and my dad and two brothers along with my dad's friend and his two kids, they were Canadian but my dad's friend and his kids were Montana residents, and they decided to go to a campground near Casper, Wyoming for a fishing trip. We all traveled together in a van all night and arrived at the site late at night. I'm the oldest of my family and the same age as the oldest son of my dad's friend, so we decided to have our own little dome tent while everyone else stayed in this large family tent. We made camp beside a river and went to bed with no disturbances. Now let me describe the campsite. It looked like the surface of the moon. No trees, only rocks and desert. A really lousy place for a 14 year old to camp. The site was chosen by my dad's friend, an avid outdoorsman and hunter due to supposed great fishing. The next day we decided to explore. All the kids headed off to see the river and play around and while hiking we came to this large rock outcrop. The base was stained black with large blotches the size of dinner plates and we found animal bones on the ground. Kinda cool but not anything us young kids thought of as weird. The day was spent in general kid fashion and as night came we had a nice meal and sat around the fire. 
we began hearing weird noises, almost like a baby crying, soft and distant. All the kids were freaked out, but my dad's friend assured us that it was a bobcat and very far away. I don't know anything about this and would appreciate anyone knowledgeable in this to confirm either way. He had a rifle in the truck and a 38 pistol with snake shot, as he called it, for ammo. So we decided to file it under not an issue and went to bed. My friend and I were in our own tent playing cards when we heard some movement outside. This was about an hour and a half after everyone went to bed, so we slowly zipped the fly down a little and looked outside. My father's friend was blocking the perimeter with his gun drawn, almost searching for something. We kept quiet while we watched him pace around with a concerned look on his face, and before he went to the main tent, he retrieved his rifle from the truck and loaded it, taking it with him to the big tent. We've never heard anything else and passed out for the night. The next day, we asked my friend's dad why he was outside last night with his gun drawn. He told us not to worry and that he had thought that he had just heard something in the camp that was kind of fishy. For us, it was weird, but I could tell that he was still a little strange about it. I should say that he's not a crazy man, he's actually a very intelligent engineer with no paranormal thoughts or anything like that, and we believe he was just worried about a legitimately dangerous animal causing damage or being a danger to everyone there at the camp. And that day, we had some weird occurrences. First, we discovered several dead rodents on the rock with black stains. We now think that the other stains were older kills, blood marks. Very weird and we have no idea how they got there. Second, we discovered tracks in the sand around the camp. They almost circled the camp, 25 meters around us, well within where darkness would have been. My dad's friend said that they resembled coyote tracks but larger. The number of tracks indicated more than one. I don't know if coyotes are in Wyoming but I assume they are. And third. Our cooler in the truck bed was open and food was rummaged through. This pointed to raccoons as they could climb and could manipulate the cooler easily. However, it didn't explain the tracks as they were definitely not raccoon prints. After the discovery of the tracks indicating a rather large animal, we decided that we would move camp the next day. The fishing had dropped off as well, so that was that and it would be our last night here. Everyone was a little freaked out about getting eaten by a wolf or whatever it was out there and we ate pretty much in silence and I could tell my father and his friend were now concerned for the kids. We moved our little pup tent closer to the big one and brought our pellet gun to bed. Fruitless I know, but it was for protection I guess. The kids all went to bed and my dad and his friend remained up talking around a campfire. My friend and I played cards until we could hear my dad and his friend finally knock off and we fell asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night we were awoken by the sounds of plates and cutlery clanging, as if it was something on the table messing with the food. We couldn't find our flashlights so my friend and I yelled to wake our dads to see what was going on, and once we did, the clanging stopped, as if whatever it was wanted to listen to where the sound came from. We were sitting in our beds, terrified as to what was outside. Then we heard this low, guttural, cooing noise that I had never heard in my life, at this point, my dad's friend called out, asking what we wanted. We started to say something was outside when there was a loud crash. We later discovered it was our wash basin being pushed off the table, followed by another loud guttural call from further away. We were full-blown panicking. It felt like my dad's friend was taking forever to go and check whatever was happening outside, and finally, we could see illumination from his flashlight as he opened the tent zipper and this is when all hell broke loose. I will describe the final events in my last post as clearly as I can remember them. The first thing I remember is my dad's friend yelling aloud, maybe to frighten off the animal. Then came the actual scream as he yelled to my father to get the rifle. There was panic conversation as they assembled in the tent. We were yelling now, asking what was going on when we heard the first gunshot. It was finally time to open our tent, what I saw has stayed with me to this day 16 years later. My father, in his boxers, had a flashlight illuminating his friend, who was holding the rifle and pointing and screaming at the truck. Upon opening the tent, my dad's friend had startled a creature near our table, apparently was drinking the water in our wash basin. 
After my dad's friend screamed at the animal, it made a call to its mate or some other animal standing near the truck. Once retrieving the rifle, he fired at the animal by the truck as the other had ran out of sight. When I managed to look outside, they had been approaching the animal, believed to be hiding behind the truck. My dad's friend approached the truck and kicked the back quarter panel, rocking it in an attempt to flush out the creature, and it worked, and the animal bolted 20 meters past our tent into the darkness. Due to the closeness of our tent, my dad's friend decided not to take a second shot. We decided to pack most of our things that night and slept in the van. We talked about what we all saw and tried to make a reasonable conclusion as to what went on that night. We decided that the animal was about four feet tall and very slender. It appeared gray with short hair, but it could have been white or tan due to only flashlights illuminating it. It had long legs that bent like a kangaroo with short arms and a short tail, and it ran on two legs, but when it first appeared behind the truck, it was on four legs for a short while before picking up on two. The animal was roughly three feet high, and its mouth and face were very dog-like. I'm living in a house with some other guys, basically in the middle of nowhere. Outside the city, there's just pretty much trees. It was an especially harsh winter, however, this night wasn't so bad. The power goes out. I look outside my enclosed porch to see if I'm the only one. The entire area is out. I forgot to mention that I'm a bit of a photography enthusiast, and this comes into play here. Well, there's nothing to do around here, and I think to myself that I've never seen such a massive power outage like this before, and this might be a cool time to do a bit of photography. I step out the door, feeling more anxious than usual. Just calm down, I told myself. Don't let this get the best of you. I continue down and take some cool photographs of some car light trails, and I can't shake this feeling that something had been following me. I start getting really nervous. It's too windy to listen around me, and we'll just call it a night there. I head back to the house, and just one more picture I told myself, and I take a pic of the house that I live in, feeling really on edge and also panicky. What the heck is going on? I've never let myself get this bad. I really feel like I'm not the only one out here. And inside, I take off my boots and snow gear next to the door. And all of a sudden, something slams into the door. I freak out right there, lock the door and get back to my room. I lock myself in there, calm down enough to sleep, and the next day I go through my pictures. I get to the picture of my house, and this picture is incredibly creepy. I can't believe my house looks like such a nightmare in that picture. But wait a second. That shadow doesn't look quite right, and I look closer. And what is that, I ask myself. I see what looks like some guy with a pig head staring right at me, and I lose it. And ever since then, I've been hearing banging around my house a couple of times a week at night, and whatever that thing is, it wants in, and I'm losing sleep over this. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night that I'd love to see you there at. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or over on email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't tell the cops the rocks took out the hobo.